Thanks for having me. And even though I was a banker, I am nice. That means um, if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and ask me. I actually love having a dialogue rather than just a monologue up here. So just do engage with me. And we do also a bit of the odd hand lifting today. Um, but you can also be welcome to shout or do whatever just to like mix it up a bit. Um, right. Let me bring this up. So I will talk today about um, something that is very important for conversion, but beyond that, it really is important for the survival of any company. And that is how to make a company user-centric. Um, we heard about it from Andre today, for example, don't make it about the features and the product, really make it about the customer, because that is the person who in the end buys our product. But that is much harder than we think, right? Because often we have leaders on the top who don't understand or they think they already know the customer. And then often at the bottom, we also don't have people who think really customer centric. They think about their own KPIs, their own promotions and their companies. So how do we build a customer led company? And I will share a little bit about how we do this at Career Foundry, my company. Um, we are a UX training company. So that should make it easy for us to be a UX led company. But for a matter of fact, it is for some reason always difficult to be UX led. And I will not tell that or not say that we are perfect, but I will share a little bit our journey on becoming UX led, uh, which includes failures and major failures. Um, I normally say, you know, one day I will write a book about 99 fuck ups I've made in building a company. I think, you know, that will be a bestseller, pro hopefully. Um, but um, I'm going to share a couple of them with you today. And I'm also going to share a couple of successes on the way. Um, yesterday I saw this on, um, on this quote on Facebook and I want to share it with you because obviously your craft CRO goes way beyond just A-B testing, right? It really goes into like how do we build products and great experiences that convert better. And this quote said, Amazon did not kill the retail industry. It did it to itself with bad customer service. Spotify also didn't kill the music industry. It did it to itself by forcing people to buy full length albums. Airbnb did not kill the hotel industry. It did it to itself with limited availability and pricing options. So basically, it's not technology itself that is the disruptor to the world. It is really being non-customer centric that is the biggest threat to any company. And that's why, you know, we need to marry CRO and UX way more in order to do this right in the future, right? Because it's not only about A-B testing. It's really about rethinking products and really putting the customer in the focus. So obviously, Ton introduced me already, but I want to share a little bit more. So right now, I am the founder of, of Career Foundry. We are based in Berlin, but we have customers all around the globe, in 85 countries to be exact. In the last four years, we trained about 27,000 people in UX. And um, we also have a team of 40 in Berlin, and then we also have a team in the US, which doesn't exactly make it very easy to do customer development on a global basis, right? Because we have customers everywhere. How am I going to, um, you know, test with somebody in Pakistan? It's very, very difficult. Um, and I, as said, I'm not a UX designer myself, I came to it through just making tons and tons of mistakes. Ton just shared one of my mistakes that we made in China when we completely built away from the customer. We built, we built for women and we had nice pink and pink wireframes and purpley and flower, flowery language and all of that, but then actually only men buy it, bought the product. And that ultimately led to the failure of Groupon in China. So it was really, really substantial. Um, with Career Foundry also, um, in the first year when we launched, we did not grow a thing, not whatsoever. And we were literally sh shortly before closing down the company. And then somebody said, have you tried this thing called um, customer development? And we're like, no. And they're like, yeah, this is a thing where you can actually understand your customer better. And we're like, well, we know our customer really well. You know, because obviously, if you if you found a company, you think as a leader that you know the customer really, really well. 
But then we did it anyways, because we were desperate, and I think that comes back to the point that was made earlier on. Like, the bigger the pain point, the bigger the pain is, the easier it is to get the management buy-in. So we did it, and we brought in a UX designer who did some proper customer development with us. And he asked the customers for their motivations. And we did a test with like 200, we spoke to about 200 users about the motivation of probably buying a product like ours. Based on that, we never changed actually the product itself, but what we did change was the way we market and the way we talk about the product. And when we launched that, that brought an 895% growth upon launch and ultimately led to what my company is today. You know, that um, we are still alive, first of all, and also like doing pretty well. So that was a huge aha moment for me. And so basically, from there, I've been thinking, like, how do you get this aha moment to other leaders and to other companies? Because I think most companies have that problem, that leaders don't understand how important it is to do UX. Right. Make UX part of the company strategy from the beginning. Right? That is what UX-led means. And now, basically, before we go into that, I want to actually ask, are there any uh, UX designers in the audience? Lift your hand. Just very few, some, yeah. Um, and for how many, of you, how many of you have companies that have a UX designer on the executive level or board of your company? Okay, maybe five, six, so very few, but a few. And um, how many of you would say that your company is actually UX-led? Very few. And I think that really reflects the state of the world, right? That maybe 5% of companies really are customer-centric. So, basically, my hypothesis is, well, before we go there, my hypothesis is we actually need to bring this... UX centricity into the executive boards of companies. Um, that means either we need to get our management team to decide to hire a UX designer, a CXO on executive level, or to get the management to understand customer centricity. And not only I think this, but it's actually something that's happening in the world. So here you see um, the latest internet trends by Mary Meeker. If you don't know Mary Mika, she is something like the oracle of the internet world. She um, runs this, she works with one of the most famous venture capital funds in the Silicon Valley, and she has this report once a year. And this just came out last month, and it shows that the ratio from developers to designers changed drastically in the last five years. Um, and that is because, obviously, consumer tech has taught us a certain understanding and expectations around design. And these expectations are now being brought into the enterprise world. So if you look at it, uh, you see between 2010 and today, companies like IBM moved from one designer to 72 developers towards one designer to eight developers, and on mobile, even one to three. So we see a ginormous shift in, in our in our organizational structures when it comes to the ratio between design and development. Design becomes way more important. And this doesn't just mean design in terms of making buttons look nice. This really means UX design, it means customer centricity. But apart from just hiring UX designer, how do you truly create a UX-led company? And this is um, three stages that actually Jared Spool once um, came up with. I just stole them from him. And he said, stage zero is there's not any UX. And I said, you know, with my company, we were at that stage in around 2014. We didn't have any UX and no UX understanding, even though I think I would have said I understand my customer, but I had no clue. Then stage two, stage one is you hire a UX designer from the outside. So for example, you hire an agency or you hire a, a freelancer and you have at least a UXer from the outside. Then stage two is you start having UX designers internally and you hire them, you know, you hire a couple of people internally. But then that brings an organizational challenge. So do you, for example, have a UX design team that works in one team? Or do you have multifunctional teams that the UX designers work maybe in the marketing team or in the product team? Or in which team should they work? Which team is most important for UX? Is it marketing or product? 
Um, and actually, we went um, in stage two in 2015 at Career Foundry, and we hired a CXO because at that point we had said, yes, we want to be UX led. We want to like bring this into a, the executive level. And we hired a, hired a very experienced UX designer who was on founder level with us. That did not work out at all. Because just having someone at the top who understands it does not mean that there's any, or means there's no one at the bottom who can actually implement the user centricity. And even though, you know, when we created new products, we would ask, oh, what does the customer think? Is that actually a product that really customers want? There was no one who could actually find out the motivations and, and make sure that the persona stayed right, who, who could build a user journey every, cup, every so often. So that failed. Um, and then we moved to stage three, where, where um, stage three is obviously a big stage, and that means everybody in the company has an understanding for UX. And also, um, there is a representation on the top and on the bottom. So that, and that is hard, right? How do you get everybody in a company to think user-centric? It's very difficult, and I think one, and I think that's why we're seeing, for example, many of these um, very established companies hiring, like increasing the developer to designer ratios, because these companies obviously they have an understanding of UX at the top, otherwise they wouldn't hire that many people in the bottom, right? So they have probably gotten design heads or like um, UX leads or something at the very, very high top of the management, but they've also built and um, gotten people who know users at the, at the bottom. And then once you have a certain amount of UX designers in the company, that spirals onto the rest of the team. Like, for example, at Career Foundry, we currently have a ratio of one to eight de developers to designers. And because there are so many UXs and we have a UX in every team, the rest of the team has started to think way more customer centric. Like before that, um, like say just a year ago, Nobody, when we thought of new features or like what to do for the next level of growth or so, nobody would say like, oh, let's actually do a user research first. Let's spend two months on just talking to users. That wouldn't have occurred to anybody because obviously you think like, oh my gosh, we want to build it fast, we want to build it now, just get it going, right? But um, nowadays when we think like, oh, what's the next phase, what's the next level of the product, people say like, let's actually talk to users first, everybody in the company. And I think we got that understanding through just openly saying we want to be UX-led, talking about this at every team meeting and obviously having their representation at top and bottom. Before we come to a couple of mistakes and, and successes, um, I want to share why we actually wanted to be UX-led. And before we became a UX-led company, we obviously did a lot of things. We, did, we were very busy, like any startup, we worked like, I don't know, between 80 to 100 hours a week. And um, we did a lot of features and produced a lot of things. But very often when we launched something new, the customers weren't actually that thrilled about it. That happened really quite a lot of time. And I think we're not the only one. We actually know that, um, that billions of dollars a year get wasted because companies start building something, but then it, 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 it doesn't need match the customer's needs, so they never really launch it. So they build it, but they don't launch it because shortly before they actually want to launch it, they realize, oh, it's actually not what customers want. Literally billions of dollars a year. And it happened to us as well. So basically, we wanted to be UX-led to stop that to make sure that we always have a top 10 pain points list of customers and tackle them by priority. The next one is we wanted a better net promoter score, so increased customer satisfaction. And we also thought we want to build a great HX. So HX is a term that means human experience. So the experience of the employees when they come to the office and um, when, for example, what is the experience of an employee that, um, for example, brings a new idea, maybe an audacious idea, an idea that could have a 10x pot potential for the company, but could equally fail? What happens to these people, especially if they do fail, right? How an HX really thinks, goes deep into thinking about the employee experience and about how do we incentivize employees to come with big ideas, even if they do fail, for example. And that's a whole science for itself. So, let's start with some of the failures we made on this journey of becoming UX-led. As already said, 
the first thing is we, we never felt we had time to actually be UX-led. We never, and I mean, that's, that's probably what most of you are facing when you are trying to do any UX work, like research, that the management will say, we don't have time. Let's just get, get start building. We want to show this to the senior executives in, in two weeks or so. Let's just do it. Um, and here's the question, like, how do you make them aware of what, how, of, of the, yeah, of the benefits of the UX work. And I think what I've seen worked really well, both in my own career, but also with many people that I'm talking about is, you know, just do it anyways, do the research anyways and show what would have happened without that research. Um, or like build mini MVPs um, and, and show that how different the, for example, the results are once you've spoken to customers than if, if it's, um, if the whole project is just engineered by the highest paid person in the room, right? Because often it comes out that the, the CTAs, the language, the colors, everything is very different what the customer likes and what actually converts to what the highest paid person thinks will convert. Another mistake was we had, as a management team, no experience in how to build a good UX process. So actually, it, is, it, it does make sense to bring in um, help in some form and really help the management to, to, to understand a good UX process. And that would be like a, a senior UX designer or like some, some good strategic people in the team. And the last thing um, that we made a mistake is we needed to find the right org structure. So we are, as a, as a young company, we're testing with org structure all the time. Uh, we're probably changing org structure about every three months. Um, and as I said, you know, the first thing is we hired a CXO, that didn't work. Then we had the teams in, um, we had UX designers in different teams. So we had one UX designer in marketing, one in product, one in branding and so on. And we thought that's great, right? Because then, you know, all of these like different areas of the business have their own UXs and it will all be magically and magical and wonderful. That did not work for us either. Because what we realized is for us at least, and it's different for every company, we need to have UX as one practice that sits together and, and really owns the whole customer journey. And then you, do you access decide on which projects they want to work, but they still have to come together and be one team to really make sure that the whole customer journey is consistent. And often, and that obviously often happens if you put people in different teams, like you exercise in different teams, then these teams almost become uh, separated from each other and like not inconsistent. Some successes, so as, um, and the successes are better than the failures. I mean, the failures were painful, but I think any company that wants to really become a design organization and user-centric will have to make failures on the way. That's in inevitable, unfortunately, right? But I think innovation brings failures with it as it is. That's inevitable. So um, one of the good things that happens, as said, is the team starts, like the whole Career Foundry team thinks users first nowadays in everything they do. And for example, we thought of a website redesign um, and the team said, why don't we do an affinity mapping exercise? Affinity mapping is a UX tool where you ask customers for motivations. And we did it via a quiz. Um, when we asked 500 people in a quiz where they, there was a raffle behind the quiz and they had to answer a couple of questions. And this was for our flagship course, which is a UX designer course that brings absolute newbies to, to professional UX designer in 10 months. It's a UX certified designer program. So we asked them, what makes you think that UX is the right career for you? And then they, pro they obviously answered in a long form, like in a, in a long form text. And we looked at literally down to the words that they used. And one of the commonalities that was used was, I am curious about human behavior. That curious about human behavior came up time and time and time again. And then the team came to me and said, let's change all of our CTAs, our call to actions, to are you curious about human behavior? And when they came to me and said that, I was literally cringing inside. I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of, about a worse CTA in my life, right? Are you curious about human behavior? What a bad CTA. But obviously, like, they had already done the statistics and they had, um, they had the backing of that the users used these wordings, so I couldn't really say anything against it. And I said, okay, let's try it for two weeks and if it doesn't work, we change it back to what we had before, which was more like, you know, get a free short course like a very usual CTA. 
And literally when they launched it, we had an increase of 2,000% from, um, in, from visitors to lead based on that CTA. It was literally groundbreaking. And it just shows time and time again that, you know, um, what us leaders or what we think the customers like and what will convert will, is, is often not what converts. And that's why, you know, the, the more often you can show management statistics like that and, and little use cases like that, the more you will manage to get them to buy into the UX first strategy. It took us a couple of times as well as said, you know, now we've had a couple of these amazing results where really like uh, UX, the UX led strategy brought the company like to a 10x a couple of times, like literally increased leads, increased sales, 10x a couple of times. So now we are obviously bought in. But I think you have to go and show that to your management. And I think you can do that as conversion people as much as you as, as UX designers. Through our top 10 pain points list that we maintained, since we have a one to eight UX design, designer to developer ratio, we also did, became more efficient at the features we actually built. So before we just built the features on product developments that we thought were the biggest pain points. But when we regularly, and we do this literally on a monthly basis, that we talk to users via surveys, like via, via, um, via quizzes, via all kinds of things, and we find out what are on a constant basis their top 10 pain points and we fix them on a priority list. And within one year, they brought an increase in 300% in our net promoter score, so in our customer satisfaction, which is huge, right? Because customer satisfaction is in the end what builds the brand, what builds the reputation of the product and what um, really builds the long-term competitive advantage of the company. And then lastly, in our HX, which is obviously my area as a, as a company leader, I mostly look at actually my own employees and how to really make the employees as engaged and, in, and, and as having mu as much initiative as possible. So we changed something for our own employees, which um, we took from the agile principles, which is pull not push is the concept. And pull not push means basically nobody likes to be told what to do. If I come and I tell you what to do, immediately you will be like, oh, I have to, maybe I'll do it, but you're not like fully engaged. It wasn't your idea and that makes you sort of maybe do it, but not full heartedly. So pull not push means we, you actually turn it around and you give employees a, a way to actually choose which projects they work on or which tasks they work on. And we changed the entire company org in a way that we had different projects and Employees could actually, at, in a six-month, uh, in a six-week project cycle, choose which project they would work on and in, with which people they would work on. So we have like a pitching system where employees can come to my, to my co-founder me, pitch an idea. We evaluate the ideas, we choose the best ones, and then they can pitch it to the entire team, and the team members can decide on which project they will work on. And that um, system is actually not very different than what we had before. Before it was just that we came up with the ideas as founders, and then we would put the project teams together ourselves. Now the employees do it themselves, but that increased engagement in the company dramatically. And we, we also like measure engagement with like internal surveys. It also incre increased the retention, so we actually hardly ha ever have anyone leaving in the company. Um, and, and it's just through and through like a really, really good way to engage employees. And I think if you want to build a great experience on the outside for your customers, you also have to start with building a great experience on the inside. Right? It's not going to be possible to just have it on the outside if it's not on the inside. And we see it with all of the companies that are great at UX. They all, like, say, for example, obviously, what is all the companies that are named normally is Google, Airbnb, um, Facebook, and so on. They have all great UX. They all have a great internal culture as well. So it has to go hand in hand. So I said I'd talk about a little bit about how does, does testing and conversion go hand in hand. I already um, mentioned a couple of these examples. Maybe one, one last one that I haven't um, talked about yet is we um, came up with a very risky, or we, we thought, okay, what's the next stage of conversion rate optimization? What do we do as a next case study? And we um, created a click funnel. Before that, we had a very, very long, long home pages with lots of content on, on the page, like the, what is modern today, right? You have the very long, long scroll through pages. So we used to have that. 
And that converted very well for some time, but obviously you have to be bold and you have to make also some big changes sometimes because only changing, only doing small incremental changes often doesn't give you like a 10x, right? It might increase conversion a little bit, but not like 10x. So for 10x often, um, at least for us, but I think that's for many companies, you have to do something bold. So we changed into an entire con uh, um, click funnel. That means instead of the long, long, long product pages, we would have just a click thing. It was, you know, it would show, for example, these are the courses. Click. Then um, this is what this is what they cost. Click. This is what you get out of it. Click. This is who has already. This is the, t the testimonials. Click. Like something like this. And um, internally, the employees hated that project. And we had a lot of pushback internally in the company because they really th said like, oh, we don't like the design of this. It doesn't look nice. It, it feels strange because they were all very used to our long product pages. And I think that's what we are as humans. You know, as humans, we don't like change and we don't like change that might not work out. Right. Um, so as this one was obviously um, pushed by us as leaders, this project, because we have seen these like big, bold um, moves work out a few times. We also have seen them fail a few times. And, um, and we launched that and we sort of, you know, it was a lot of internal work to get, actually get the employees to, not only employees, but also investors, by the way. Investors didn't like it as well either, right? Because they said, oh, this is risky. What do you do if it doesn't work? Then you've worked three months on this click funnel and you essentially waste, wasted three months. But we did launch it and it brought a 160% increase in lead conversion um, in, in the first four months. So that, um, that also is, is something that is always, um, yeah, always interesting, right? And always difficult, like if you make the big changes, because I think um, most of you will have to also deal with that, right? I mean, we're talking a lot about A-B testing, but that is also not always everything. So, right. Then the last thing, um, I'm coming to the end. How much time do I have left? Two minutes, super. Um, if you think about how do you how to convince the management of a customer centric approach, what numbers can you give them? What can you tell them? As said, you know, make your own case studies. Make try it yourself. Like build a couple of of these success studies where you actually talk to users and you change the product completely from what the highest paid person wanted and it converts better. If you can prove that this works a few times and just do it with many many MVPs, that will help them change their mindset. So that's the first thing. The second is we actually created a report with um, Career Foundry and our, our sub-brand, which is called the UX School, on, um, and we asked 60, over 60 UX experts and how they actually um, talk to their management about UX and why to invest in it. And what we really saw is um, the, the, the craziest statistic is 1.4 trillion dollars are lost due to not investing in UX, mostly because of checkouts being not optimized. Um, and I think that's a really, really strong statistic. And there's like tons of statistics in this report if we want to go and have a look at it. And then maybe an, I'm, I'm ending with a question: like, how many of you have started to optimize for voice, for voice recognition? Very few people. So this is also, I didn't know this, but voice already today, 20% of all mobile searches are via voice. And I think hardly anyone is optimizing for voice today. And I think that shows, you know, as an industry, CRO needs to be much more customer centric because customers are using voice. And in just three years, so in, by 2020, 50% of all searches, not only mobile, literally all global searches will be via voice. So there's a lot to come. And I think, you know, if we're not customer centric, we will not see these, these changes. This is obviously, and I talked to a couple of people in, at the conference, it's mostly younger people, right? Most of the, the people in the, in the teenage, the teen, teenagers and 20, 25 years below, they're using voice way more than maybe our age group, which I think is around 30, 35 in this room. And, and I think that, that is, for example, one of the reasons for us to really think like what are users doing, how are users' behaviors changing. So the takeaway from today is user experience really needs to come to the executive table. And UX led is not just cool, it brings a key competitive advantage to any company and um, also to the conversions that we're trying to achieve for our companies. Conclusion, um, it's a journey. You're not going to 
become UX-led without any mistakes. There will be mistakes on the way, but it's a really worthwhile journey. And um, I'm going to be around if you want to talk to me about it afterwards. We also can help you. We can help speak to your management teams. We also have courses to build, build more user centricity into an organization. And we also have a course on voice design um, very, uh, as a very new um, uh, course that we built with Amazon Alexa. So um, I'm looking forward to the questions and hopefully we'll have good conversations about this afterwards as well. Thank you. Thank you.